you got a you got a new single coming out. You've been busy. Art is there to like you know provoke change, social yeah. change, or personal change, or whatever it is. Uh, so it's a roots reggae song. I'm going into that space of sound system, um, but I don't. It's not something that's really spoken about very often in in reggae music and in Jamaican culture, even though it should be spoken about. Mm. And for me in Asia. It's been definitely a huge challenge to speak out about it because it's a taboo topic. You know, in Asia we know golden silence, right? And it's definitely a taboo topic. How was, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. How was uh, your tour? Yeah, it was real good, man. Um, Nanjing was especially really quick, crazy, but Danying's a, a cool little town that I go to a bit. And uh, it's the eyeglasses capital of China. And uh, they have this great couple that does their stuff there. And uh, Harbin was, you know, it's negative 20. And uh, Ooh, got to meet a couple cool cats. And I got a tattoo in the living room of a of a punk rock guy who lives there and that was fun oh wow okay yeah yeah, yeah. was it my something... first ever tattoo oh yeah i was gonna say do you have a bunch this is your first ever tattoo from that's my, my first the my first so yeah i was like um I, I, there's a there was a guy who played punk rock stuff in shanghai and um he uh i met up with him when he was in harbin and we just hung out you know just catching up whatever he's like and I knew he did drawings and tattoos and stuff. He's like, yeah, man, you want me to give you a free tattoo hmm. in my living room? And I was like, okay, let's do it. And he, <laughs> he drew something and then he, he, he stitched it, tested it out on, um, on, uh, my arm. And then I, you know, we just did it. Okay. It just, it just seems so crazy. I'll send you, I'm going to, um, it just seems so weird and random. And I'm like, it's a new year. Let's do some fun shit. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> And like, so I'm like, I got my first tattoo at 36. So there you go. Wow, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I haven't gone in. I kind of feel like I'm kind of past the point now. I don't really feel that energetic for it. Right, right. I, you know, it was just like, I just figured why the fuck not? Like I, you know, I never really put too much focus, like in attention in that regard. But I was just like, this is just so funny. And I'm in heartbeat. So what the fuck? I just sent you a JPEG of it. It's it's really big. It's all over my arm. If it wasn't so oh, wow. chilly, yeah, 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 yeah. Shit, I was gonna say yeah. it's something like Big Bad, motherfucker. That's yeah. It's my it's my logo. Yeah, you drew oh, my logo. logo. Okay. What is a yeah? Atlantic H is such a weird document name. Hold up. Uh, oh, that that. What's that? Is it coming from your phone? It must be coming from your phone. Oh wow. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah. that's WeChat. Yeah, That's yeah. taken straight from WeChat. Dope, dope. Disco ball. Oh, I see. I see. It's the I disco ball think. globe. Yeah. And yeah, he yeah. put my hat in. And when he comes back to Shanghai, we're going to make my hat red. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah my, my logo has always been Atlas holding a disco ball globe. I disco. See. Yeah, yeah. Combination. Yeah. So oh, he, he did it like that. Dope, dope, dope. Yeah. He's giving you, uh, yeah, you got the beard in there. I was kind of trying to figure out which angle the face was, but now I totally see it. Are you going to fill in more than just yeah, the yeah. hat or is this going to be the red hat? Um, I think in terms of color, I think just the just the hat. I yeah. think that's what we're going to do. Yeah, it's like a you, you kind of gave him a beard, but it's also Atlas and shit, so why not? Yeah. And now I, 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 I'm, I'm down to get another one too, but I'll oh, get my wow. next one in Mongolia. <laughs> I'll get my next one in Mongolia. So you broke in the, you broke, you popped the cherry, dude. You're fucking, now you're going. A bit. 
A bit, a bit. Well, now, I like the idea now of getting tattoos in places that mean a lot to me. And uh, yeah. Mongolia would definitely work. And now I got one in China. And so we'll see. Sure. But I'm in a rush, and I'm not going to be traveling too much f- for a bit anyway. But <laughs> yeah, tour was tour was real good. I recorded some interviews, did some things there, and then um, cool. I just it looks like I'm going to be. I met with Sonray Entertainment, which is a big management company, and they want to be promoting their stuff in China, and um, so I'm going to start interviewing some of their artists, which is like this weird, like eclectic group of people. So next week. But they're they're all really big. So next week I'm going to be interviewing the lead singer of Journey, Arnel Panetta, the Filipino guy. The lead singer of Journey. Of Journey. Yeah. yeah, like 15 years ago, they the band was in between lead singers, and they found a cat on YouTube, and he's a Filipino guy, and you know, they 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 hired him. So. Well, he's been, you know, playing arenas and shit, and now Journey's huge in the Philippines and stuff. So, you know, he's put out two albums with them. They're working on the third. So the lead singer, and then this this Alice Cooper guitarist Ornthai, who worked with Steven Tyler and all that shit. So, oh, right. anyway, oh. just just another thing. And I should be, uh, I got a a fellow student here because I'm in a master's program because I should be working on a paper. But instead, I was like, Yo, man, I got to talk to Nick. <laughs> so let's do this and Maja and Maja who uh, I love and she's coming hopefully she right gets now. here soon but a boom. all right yo I hear in China that um yo oh yo what up hey Maja can't hear her either she got the clearest yo what's up you hear me oh now I hear you Dope, dope, dope. All right, all right. I want right, any. Y'all? What's up, everybody? Thank you for coming on the show. Um, can Brian? Can you introduce our uh, special guest? Why don't you do that? Oh man, what an honor! All the way from Singapore via Montreal in the fall and Jamaica in the winter, but now in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, it's the Far East Empress of dancehall and hip hop. It's Major One. Dope, dope, dope. <laughs> big up, big up, big up. I get this background, this major league background. <laughs> I just just made this up. I told you, man. I, it's got the little baseball. Yeah, we're doing. I, I'm a I'm a huge. Let me tell you, Nick. All right. So I I I enjoy your music, man. And I have some friends who make really good music. And but like I meet them beforehand. Mesia, and I tell her this all the time. It's really embarrassing. I don't even want to look at the screen. I was a huge Mesia one fan like giant and i and I, I can blush about that all day and i'm still a fan of her new music i'm looking so forward to hearing her new single i'm psyched but then i gotta be friends with her and that's just so awesome and i got a dj for her and we went to mongolia and all sorts of stuff i'm sure we'll get to talk about so thank you yeah. for joining me Mesia. this is the empress right here nope, oh. nope, nope. <laughs> big up big up koala lumpur how you doing major one I'm good. We just got it went into lockdown here, like full lockdown ah. again yesterday. So uh, back to the studio and, and uh, home creation. No doubt, no doubt. What does that What does that mean? Full lockdown? Like you guys can't go? Like what's happening there on the ground? Well, I think it means that. Well, Christmas time it was just full on here. Like you know, you, SOPs were not, not being respected. Um, Mask, masks are kind of rock on the chin, you know, like the chin mask style. All right, right. I do that myself. <laughs> uh, Maja, Maja made me so proud. She made me awesome. The city I lived in for two years was Darkhan, Mongolia. And we mm-hmm. visited there and we did a performance in Maja even. She's got these cool masks promoting her, her latest EP now, Freedom Face, which is, which is great. But like she made a Darkhan ones too. And that's so cool. Are you wearing a Darkhan vest? There it is. Oh, oh man. man. So Biggie. cool. Biggie. Yes. Yeah. What's the, what's seen, the th- <laughs> story? I haven't seen B.O. since Mongolia. So yeah. we were in the black market in Darhan and I found this beautiful fabric and he was telling me how it's the emblem of the city in Mongolia, Darhan. Ah. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do something with it. I'll put it on a hat. I'll put it on a jacket. And true to my words, since this is the first time I'm seeing B.O. since Mongolia, 
You know, I had to rock the dark on Steve's. Like, check, 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 <laughs> oh, check the speed sailing. Yeah, flex. Yes. Flex. And this I'll, is all part of the home creations, home, home isolation world. Right. <laughs> Major One learns to sew. <laughs> It, it, she is, she's not just the Far East Empress of where she's at. It's all of Asia. It's a, not just Far East Asia. It's, it's Central Asia. Asia too. Yeah. Like, um, it's just, uh, so I, like, I was just telling Nick, like, I just got my first tattoo and, uh, I got it in, in hard being in a living room from a punk rock guy. But anyway, I was only just way. telling, I think it's the only way to do it. It was just the, but anyway, I, I won't go into repeating that. But I told him I had my idea for my next tattoo. And my next tattoo has got to be the Darkhan logo. You got it. You got it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. It's, it's that's a really it. sick logo, man. It looks really cool graphically, too. And with the meaning behind it, that's fucking fresh. Right? Yeah. Well, well, because especially because it was a mechanical city, it was kind of built to be the steel town. So if you look at it, it's actually two bolts kind of intersecting. You know? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. It's fresh though. Just yeah. the way it looks is like, uh, yeah. It makes you want to inquire about like what exactly is going on with that thing. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's dope. How did you find out about uh, Maisie's? What was the first thing you heard that made you such a fan of Maisie's music? Oh yeah. Okay, so, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> I was actually in, in here. <laughs> okay, so I was in Kuala Lumpur. No. And. Yeah, no, I found it in Kuala Lumpur, and I met, I was staying at an art house, which was like, it was like a hostel, but I was kind of just surfing the couch there, and the, I said, hey, what, what music should I know? What should I get into? And the girl, the woman who I was staying with was Joan, Joanne, who's oh, now rapping. That's absolutely a fact. So now she's an MC now. So now she's releasing music and doing songs with Major. She's got something upcoming out right now, right? That's right. I've been I've been kind of like shoving her along the way. Her, yeah. She great. talked. She yeah. talked about then how she was. Go she showed me like one demo she had done. Then she's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna be a rapper." And I was like, "Yeah, man, do your thing." And it took years and years and years. But I'm so happy to see her. She's rapping in Chinese now. But oh. she introduced me to your music. And I got, and look, uh, I love Far East Empress. I love uh, The Islands, the, the, the dual album you did. Yeah. I like the Freedom Fade EP. I told Major, her latest EP is such a great walking at night, like 3 a.m. thing. But, and I say this with love, I tell everyone, one of the great hip hop albums of all time is Bootleg Culture. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, I okay. busted out my headphones. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I'm literally. I mean, like, the I, the the first three songs of that album are um, "Warrior's Tongue," uh, uh, "Walkers" with the um, air, walkers. air Air Walkers, yeah, and "All Right, Okay." Like you're talking about like three like anthems, three amazing songs. I'm gonna send you this right now because I uh, this is something that Nick and I talk about how important it is to support local music and not necessarily the top 40 stuff so i played last weekend all right okay at a club gig that i was doing and people were like yo what's that song that you played and so i they hit me up on wechat and i'm like this is what it's about so i i am i am just i am just uh, on the bench of the major league promoting her stuff and stuff because it's really the best so uh major major with rizzas on there there's so many good but her, uh, her her music is just such an interesting blend of reggae and dancehall and hip-hop and pop and it you know there's some hardcore stuff on there like it's just the best so, tell us tell us with this great intro about this uh bootleg album that you did <laughs> why don't you carry bootleg culture it's called bootleg culture, bootleg culture yeah. yeah and you have All rizza right. on an album called bootleg culture <laughs> I mean, this show is based in Hong Kong, right? So, I mean, I think in Asia, we understand bootleg culture. Heavy. To the most. <laughs> um, but I think it was also asking the question of like, where do all the kind of like brand designers, like top high end lines get their inspiration from? Well, they get it from street culture. It's, it's the artists, the grassroots community. 
um, the, the social issues that bubble up from the bottom, those are the things that inspire it until it finally eventually gets into like high-end fashion, high-end products, magazines and media. I mean, media is probably going to be like a year late on real trends that have been going on for a long time in the underground. So okay. I wanted to pose that question to say like, sure, you know, an L LV will be pissed off at a, a bootleg LV bag, but I've seen some graffiti LV bags, you know, like straight wild style graph on an LV bag. Where did they take that? Which, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The, where did the bootleg start? <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, but the, the, the story behind that record is I was really blessed to be able to work with a man named Che Vicious. Uh, he is a producer that uh, worked for Good Music, Kanye West. He was one of the main producers behind the miseducation of Lauryn Hill. My God. Uh, yeah, what? like it's, it's like a, a, any hip hop head's dream to work with this producer, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, my record before I had released a song called Return of the B-Girl. And it kind of like was rotating in Canada. It was doing well because of the video. And I got a phone call one day, and at the time, Che was working for Aftermath, Dr. Dre, you know, ah. and uh, gave me a phone call and said, like, hey, we call him from Aftermath. We think your, your spits and your lyrics and your style is really great, but you need some better production. All right, <laughs> and yeah. And when I, when I got the call, I'm like, yeah, I'm right. This is Dr. Dre later, y'all. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, they kept kind of pursuing and, like, hitting me up. And at the time, I was living in Toronto, Canada. And they said, yo, we're going to be in Detroit next week. We're working on Eminem's new record. Why don't you come down here and, and let's chat it up? And I'm, I'm pitching myself like, okay, is this, is this real? Or, you know, like, well, let me just jump on a Greyhound bus at the time. I had just graduated college, jumped on a Greyhound bus, went to Detroit, showed up at what looked like a crack house. And uh, it turned out to be like the camouflage for an incredible studio inside. And I got to meet the guys. And from there, it, it was history. Like, they flew me to Arizona to test run, like, my ability to write, I suppose, my ability oh. in MC. Yeah, they locked you in a room without a phone? <laughs> What's that? Yeah. I, yeah. I, <laughs> no phones, <laughs> flow. And uh, we, we recorded at Bone Thugs and Harmony's studio. And they gave, they were kind of playing this beat that I was like, oh, that beat's hard. That's just, oh, can I cuss? Can I cuss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's too late now. You know? <laughs> oh shoes um and it turned out to be a beat that they were produced they were going to pitch to nas i was like yo if i rock that beat can you get me on a song with nas <laughs> and um they they're like well why don't you give it a shot and at the time the other producer i was working with travis von cartier said "Maja, think anthem think an anthemic and so i wrote the song called warrior's tongue when, when I was listening to this beat, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be on a song with Nas. It's going to be great. Yeah. But actually, the studio really loved what I wrote. And they're like, you can have it. You can have this beat. Oh, wow. So, Insane. Yeah, really and that, that music video is amazing, too. Everyone, anyone who hears my voice should definitely go check out that music video. Google that. Got that was big trap. And stuff. I mean, it's amazing. And the horn in the beginning. Call me daddy like my name was Kane. I fight, call me caddy, raised again. 
against the grain on the download, daddy. I'm just playing the game, yeah. I ended up in Tondor, Philippines, which is like hood, hood, you know, like the hood of the hood. And uh, we got permission from the dawn of the hood to shoot, and we ran around this place. And um, you know, I the, being off a record called Bootleg Culture. I mean, from Philippines to like we we're just traveling around Southeast Asia doing crazy stuff. And man, it's real blessing in life. I gotta add that. For anyone else out there listening that's an artist, that's a creative, that's an entrepreneur hoping and dreaming their biggest dream, I gotta say at the time when they pitched Warrior's Tongue to all the labels, because they wanted to sign me and they're just like, well, you know, we don't know what to do with this hip hop reggae thing. Like hip hop and dance hall, no one's ever heard of that. This was pre-Major Lazer, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's not possible. It's not gonna go anywhere. We can't do it. But six years later, it was remixed by a producer and placed as the trailer of Fast and Furious 8. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Crazy. I just want to share, like, you know, the weirdest yeah. thing that you come up with. Maybe yeah. it will not be immediately absorbed or recognized, but sh six years later, we... They yeah, were you just got to go, you just got to go with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Speak and the on. remixes, there's some great remixes to that song too. Like the original is hot. The remixes I play all the time. It's great. I should mention that the reason it was called Bootleg Culture was also because we were transitioning into the Spotify era at this time uh, or, or the, the platform era. And I had released the physical form of this album with a blank, a branded blank disc for encouraging people to burn my music and bootleg my music, basically. Oh, and it also Whoa, damn. You don't have a physical copy of this? I'll get you one. I do not. I don't. There's five remaining ones in my possession. I'll give you one. <laughs> <laughs> there's, Great. A, there's a branded blank disc so you can bootleg my shit. And then there's also a disc inside with all the acapella stems. Oh, so that really? Anyone really? So producers out there could bootleg my shit, like could make remixes endlessly. And when we did that, we ended up getting like, I think there's 34 official remixes of Warrior's Tongue. Like oh, officially. ew. So it got yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah, and it, it was a blessing. It was a crazy idea to begin with, and then it went on to be quite a blessing. That's crazy. It's kind of like you took, uh, you, you know, the coup, the coop, that, that uh, oh, yeah. the Bay Area? They did that yeah, album yeah, yeah. Steal This Album, and then they had that album with uh, the two Twin Towers. They actually had like them burning before that actually happened and stuff, but it was called Steal This yeah, Album, and I they were encouraging that. people to go just like take it out of stores. It kind of makes me think of something like that, but that's super fresh, <laughs> man. Yeah, there was, a, I think Jerry Rubin wrote the book called Steal This Book, so they were basing it off of that, yeah. But yeah, those guys were real cool. I saw them in full. The record yeah. came with instructions on how to bootleg my shit, so. <laughs> <laughs> Dope. Yeah. Why was it received by a major label, I wonder? Like, <laughs> I wonder. Uh... <laughs> yo, yo, but go back and going back to the dance hall and hip hop thing, you have roots in Toronto, and that's not a new sound in Toronto at all. Can you go back and talk a bit about that? Because there were people like Cardinal Fischel. There's a yeah. very big West Indie culture in yes, uh, well, Toronto, you know, Canada with that mix with Jamaica and stuff and the yeah, island. I mean, Caribbean people. Toronto is a huge mix, really multi multicultural community. And during that time, it was a really exciting time for Toronto mu uh, music. You know, everything was bubbling up. This was pre-Drake era. Yeah, hell yeah. The 1.0. 1.0. <laughs> yeah, Toronto 1.0. It was still the T dot. It was yeah. still the screw face capital. Yeah, you know, yeah. and um, it was really cool because on any given kind of, I started hitting open mics and battles and, and stuff like that in Toronto. You know, I've written raps all my life, but I was just too shy. I was a graph writer first before anything else. Of course. And Everybody's so a B-boy, B-girl something, man. It's all just for the love, man. I was a writer, yeah. and I was too shy to get in front of people. But when I started taking a chance in Toronto and hitting those open mics, um, we do that during the week. And then on the weekends, we go to some, like, dance hall, bashment, debauchery, reggae sound system, <laughs> something, you know? Dope, and it doesn't dope. stop there. I mean, in Toronto, you could, on, on any given night, you could go to a hip-hop jam and a punk jam and a house jam all in the same night. Yes, yes, so, yes, yeah. Yeah. So There's genres... Probably genres yeah. matter less and less to me sorry i just got to turn on some lights here but how did you get were you born in canada or were you born in 
Asia to begin with and then went over there? Like, how did this all happen to Canada and Toronto to begin with? So I was born in Singapore. I, um, I moved to Canada when I was eight years old, ah. but I discovered hip hop in Singapore. So I found a bootleg public enemy tape in a marketplace called Badok. And uh, I took that tape with me. And when I arrived to Canada, I'm like, I'm closer to the Bronx. There must be more of this stuff here. Oh, so I started wow. looking for it, you know, I started just looking for it. So I found De La Soul. I found like all the native tongue stuff. I was on the West Coast. So at the time, like E-40 was popping. Snoop was on the come up. Like, yeah, yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dre, how would I know years later I get to work with him. Yeah. But yeah, so... I was just a kid that loved hip hop and it was unlikely that I discovered in, in Singapore because all my cousins were listening to like J-pop or Taiwanese pop music. Um, but I didn't rap until I moved to Toronto. I was going there for an architecture degree, which oh. I got, by the way, from all the Chinese parents out there. <laughs> you didn't even know. <laughs> Can study. Very good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just started getting involved in things in Toronto. Uh oh, sorry, let me close this. Um, what was I going on about? <laughs> Toronto. And, and um, yeah, like in a lot of your earlier stuff has got like a head nod in hardcore hip hop feel to it. Although, and that, you know, uh, what, what, what's the name of your first album? Misag I always mispronounce it. Misaga, Misaga. Misaga, yeah. Misaga. It's, Mississauga, yeah. It's got that head nod and hardcore hip-hop, you know, lo-fi sound. Well, I mean, before yeah. I started anything, I was part of this crew called Local Genius. And um, I kind of got frustrated because, like, you know, rappers like to sit in studios and be like, yo, we're going to be the next thing to blow up. We're going to be huge. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy, dude. But no one was actually doing anything. So I literally worked six jobs, saved up some money, uh, put together a record called Mississauga. Mississauga is an area in Ontario close to Toronto. It's like a suburb of Toronto. And um, it was named after everyone that helped me put this thing together when I had no know-how of the music business or money. They're all from Mississauga. So I named the record to thank everybody from Mississauga that helped me. Um, and and it, just, it just went from there. I planned on it not just being a one-time thing, but I ended up getting a commercial out of it and it just kept rolling. Um, at the time, there was no other Asian female faces in hip hop in Canada. So on one hand, it was good because uh, if anyone wanted to book me for a gig, they'd be like that Chinese chick that raps and it'd probably come back to me. <laughs> but on the other hand, there's a lot of racism, a lot of sexism. I've heard the worst shit you could ever imagine, internet trolls, the whole thing. Um, the first thing I popped off on was a video called Split Second Time. And the video came out after Jin's Speak Chinese, I think the record was called. You know the rapper Jin who like blew up yeah. like, on the leagues and in the freestyle and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and I loved Jin and I thought it was really dope to see someone that looked like me on the American mainstream. But the problem is when they signed him, I think it was Rough Riders, and it came out, it was just like an American wet dream of what they think Asian people should B or say is like chingy chingy chong chong speak Chinese chong chong chong. I was like, damn son, this is terrible. <laughs> like I know how intelligent and great he was, so I made this video called Split Second Time. It was to poke fun at all the stereotypes of Asian people that kung fu fighting, Harajuku girls, all that stuff. Um, and it ended up being the first time I popped off, but there was definitely a lot of racist and sexist backlash from it. You just keep going, man. Were, were, was it a big switch for you? Like, uh, the, the next thing you did was like the dual albums, right? Where it's um, <laughs> the Islands and uh, Montreal, right? Like, like, did you put those out together? Or how did, did you, you know, is that, did you release them at the same time? Or was it like in sequence? How did that work? Well, I feel like this was the decade or the era of like physical albums. And I love tangible things. I love magazines when you open them and smell them and see the, you know, the photo shoots and stuff. I love uh, vinyl. I love getting those liner notes and reading them. So it's pretty like, it almost seems egotistical to release a double album as your second record because I was still green in the business. <laughs> like, yes, listen to my double record. Um, but 
I was really creating from a very genuine place. I wasn't really thinking about music business, music industry. I was independent, so I was allowed to not be quaffed and all of these things. Uh, I've definitely had my fair share of a and be like, Maja, baby, like, if you just rap in a bikini and do this and that, it'd be amazing. And so if I had made the decision to be an independent, a fiercely independent artist, then I would do something crazy like put a two double album out as my second record. Um, so no, there was no rhyme or reason. It just went out as a double record. It did meet a lot of criticism that said, perhaps Maja would be do better to edit herself. And I'm like, I don't need to, because I'm independent, baby. <laughs> um, but I think much like the kind of the in industry of today, back then, you still kind of get a pop when you release videos. So every time we released a new video for the record, that would be the song that would pop off. So it was okay that I released it as a double record, I think. And I guess the quick backstory behind that was I had, that was, Pulau was the first time I came back to Asia after leaving from immigrating to uh, Canada. And so I discovered the islands, like Pulau is Malay for islands. And I found an island called Tioman. I paid like, I think it was like 400 bucks to live there for over two months. I set up a studio on the islands, swam with turtles and just recorded that record. Awesome. Really good reflection. <laughs> I, yeah. I haven't thought of these things in so long, man. I, I I'm still waiting for the the major book. I told you that before. <laughs> that that needs to. Well, I was talking. Someone was talking to me the other day, and uh, like this last week about writing a book. And he's like, "What will your biography, autobiography, be called?" And jokingly and non-jokingly, I said it would be called "Pimp Yourself," because. <laughs> I am not that like conscious artist that um, necessarily would not, you know, study the trends and, and, and kind of um, understand what's out there right now or use a TikTok or whatever. A, a lot of things that people would call selling out if you're a true artist. I don't believe that. I believe in uh, relating to the masses, in using popular culture, but actually spreading a positive message in popular culture instead of one about materialism and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I do believe in pimpage, pimpage, and um, I love studying what major industry actually does. But yeah. I, I think take those tools and then pimp yourself. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I, I still remember when we were staying in a gear in the countryside of Mongolia in Darkhan, you were working on your laptop on the entrance yeah. there late at yeah. night. And I, yeah, you were, and you're doing a lot. I mean, you, you, I, you, you're a great artist. I like your drawings too, but you also got sukkah sukkah sauce and uh, <laughs> other things you're doing too. I, I think something that occurred to me for creatives early on was that you kind of have to treat the hustle like an art itself, right? I, I meet a lot of artists like, nah, we don't do that. We just create from our genius and we don't do none of that marketing and da da da, you know? But it, it's kind of needed in today's market because we become our own franchises and we, we build a business around the things that we love to do. So for that reason, I felt that, okay, early on, I'm gonna make the hustle a joy and, and part of the crazy art. And um, that first record, Mississauga, Actually, as an Asian female, I went to a lot of record labels at the time, and everyone told me I was not marketable. They're like, we've never seen a Chinese female rap. Hip hop is not for girls, uh, Asian girls. It's not going to work. So I basically made a call out on the internet for people to send me $20 in a greeting card, the way your grandmother used to send you money, maybe. Um, it could be any kind of greeting card. It could be a wedding, happy birthday, congratulations on your baby, whatever it is but just put $20 inside. And I sold a thousand records this way when I first started in the business. And so, wow. <laughs> and so when I went in to see the labels, they wanted to see my SoCan num like what sound scan numbers to prove that I've sold these things. So I brought in like 500 greeting cards of letters people had written to me and the $20 inside the whole night. I'm like, look, like this is better than sound scan. This is like people that would trust me not to like, jack their money and I would actually send something back. Um, but they're like, no, we need sound scan. This doesn't apply. 
So that kind of gave me the idea that like, yo, I could do this independently. I probably make more money and I can make the business of music really, really hilariously fun. So I think that's always been the mindset. That's true. I think, I think Nick, you're still having some microphone problems again. He was having some stuff before. Can't hear him. But like, Nick, but when you're talking about doing, you think you're doing business stuff, but like, that's got to be a radical, crazy business decision to be like, okay, well, I'm going to move to Jamaica then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How does this jump off? Okay, okay, okay. So I, I got my dream job working with Che. Che's to this day, it's amazing. Um, I helped him set up a kind of a subsidiary label called Cops and Robbers, but it never popped off. There was something that happened with the investor, et cetera, et cetera. So I spent a lot of time in LA and I've been spending a lot of time ghostwriting as well. But I was starting to feel like um, a little drained from it, you know, because uh, I was writing for a lot of really beautiful women, but a lot of beautiful people that couldn't sing or rap. So mm. every day I was like, what do you want to write about? And just be like, love. And I'm like, okay, what about love? Like, I'm very spiritual. I'm like, I do yoga. I'm very spiritual. Okay, tantric love. And you sit in the studio and write these terrible songs. I mean, not <laughs> okay, I, I shouldn't be all negative. I really learned how to write hooks during this right, time. Right, right. The everything in the industry. But after a while, it's like, what am I doing, man? Like, you know, I'm, I'm this, per this spirit that, that is now like writing tantric love songs about yoga. Mm. So um, I asked myself, and it wasn't so much a business decision. It was more of a personal decision. Right. Where I was like, right. where in the world is the opposite of Los Angeles or Hollywood life? And I remember when I was a kid, my brother used to play like Peter Tosh, uh, Toots and the Maytals, uh, Black Uhuru, mm. like all the old school reggae. And he'd scream things like, Bon Babylon! And I'm like, what the hell is he talking about? You know, I would never understand what the, the message or the political intonations of what society was with these songs. So I'm like, I think Jamaica would be the opposite of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so is is it your brother who... Oh, is it your brother who sings on your new EP? Is that is that a, your brother? No, on my new EP, it's General Ling. It's it's. Uh, no, 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 no. The 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 last song, um, Good Times, uh, uh, Good. Oh, uh, good news! What, no, no. Good news. Has the same last name as me, but it's a okay. Artist named Lincoln. Lincoln. All right. Okay. Okay. I I was guessing there, but I all right. Sorry. So um. You know, a, fr a friend's mom had a charity in Jamaica, and I just like upped and moved to a ghetto called Eight Mile. Oh, sorry, Eight Mile. <laughs> Eight Mile. Tree Mile. <laughs> and uh, I was just te I was supposed to be there to teach English, but I was teaching kids how to record themselves, how to run independent business. And oh. that time in Jamaica really opened my eyes because I think there was an era of MCs that would always like rap in your face and try to make you so impressed um, that of all the syllables I could fit into these, these, these lines, you know? But it was never a matter of understanding the crowd's reaction and like having the energy go back and forth, you know? Mm. It was more of this egotistical thing where, check out how ill I am as an MC. And so what Jamaica taught me when I went to like uh, street parties and dance halls and toasting sessions, even with old Jamaican men that would just be like, you know, doing old school style rub dub is that there's so much concentration of performance as understanding the, the exchange of energy between people yes. and, and switching it up when, when it's not working, you know? So I learned a lot of that from Jamaica. Nice, nice. So were you, were you performing before you, you know, like this was like kind of like the next stage of it. Were you performing a lot and experiencing this in Toronto, Montreal, LA or? Yeah, I mean, I had already been like quite far. I mean, I, I released two records. I've been performing a lot. I started performing in Asia again, which was another hustle. I, I got, no one had heard of me in Asia. I had left Singapore since I was eight years old. Um, but I got my roommate who was like in his boxer shorts and on the couch going like, yo, you never heard of Major One? She's huge. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. And out of that, I was able to start booking in Asia. And then oh, off, dope. Of those, yeah. <laughs> off of those bookings, I was able to start building a portfolio and making a reputation for myself. So it was really like 
I, I don't know. A lot of people saw it like, you know, there's a lot of rumors about me. One was that I'm a, a extremely wealthy girl that just paid my way to get everything that I've wanted in life. And that's how I got to where I am. I'm like, well, fantastic if people think that I'm a billionaire. That's amazing. <laughs> how did that happen? Crazy Rich Asians, <laughs> <know>? the prequel. <laughs> yeah. Like the empress. But the truth is, like, you know, we, we really hustled and, you know, we sold stuff on the, you know, chop mixtapes on the corner in the middle of winter. I do it myself. Um, wow. One story that comes to mind is like we were flying and, and selling stuff on, on the corner in Toronto. It was like minus 10. And Hell this guy yeah. comes up to me and he'd be like, you know what? Screw Major One, you know? Who cares about this girl? You think she's all up there and she's all rich and shit? And I'm like, yeah, fuck that bitch. Gonna, like, screw that bitch, you know? But he's talking to me. <laughs> and he's like, before he left me, he was like, you know what? You shouldn't work for her. You're really cool. And I, I think you got a really nice vibe and you probably should do your own music. It's like, thanks, man. <laughs> All right, I got a double album coming. <laughs> oh, yeah, shit. Pick up my double album, yo. <laughs> But I mean, it's it's just a crazy it's a crazy business. You gotta do what you gotta do, and um and 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 build yourself up and get there. You know. That's But, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I think I got cut off because I wanted to say you're like you sounded like like too short with those like gift cards. You're like selling from your trunk. You know what I mean? Like fuck well, soundstand, like, man. Like fucking, <laughs> I'm just out in the streets doing my thing. You gotta respect that. Like these yeah. kids now, they're just using social media to try and get through, man. There's even like, you know, people saying like, oh, you're, you're SoundCloud artist or you're TikTok artist, but like you right. don't show up in person. Right. I've had, I actually tried to interview a couple people now and they won't perform. They will be like, we only deal with you on social media. It's like that kind of artistry now, you know, like it's like, we're not going to show up in person. Mm -hmm. You can't book us. No yeah, yeah. Which is like, if it's not in our environment and our own control platform, control. we're not coming to rock with you man like that that sort of thing you talk about people in jamaica feeling the crowd and stuff yeah that's yeah. that important for any sort of performing yeah. artist not even a hip-hop artist mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that's true. know that's what to true. do man like if you don't have that experience and you're just gonna come out and like bleep bleep on a mini keyboard and i, I don't know yeah you know, you gotta catch the vibe I, mean, I, i think everything has moved into a much more curated space even with the pandemic now Uh, we call it live performances, but mm. I've I've gone to a few shoots and there's nothing live about those performances. Yeah, everything tough, is recorded, man. everything yeah. like there's not a yeah. thing out of place. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I think we gotta. I hope that the cycle comes around again that we can start celebrating reality, the raw, the, the ugly. Yeah. Even <laughs> ugly isn't ugly, you know. And I I really hope that we can. One of the first things I did when I first moved back to Singapore was to call a battle. I'm like, all right, give me your top three MCs. Let's do this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Still got that hip hop blood in you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's hip hop, right? Like that is yeah. essentially hip hop. The fact that we could mm. step up to the plate, take a chance on ourselves, like that we could fail and that we could be mm. ridiculed. But you know what? This is who I am and you stepping up to that plate. And if you suck and everyone boos you, You get back there and you work on your skills. Yeah, work on your you craft, earn man. That respect, like yeah. earn that respect. And yeah. Yeah. I think that mentality is a bit different now. And so when I came back to Singapore, I was like, give me your top three MCs. Let's do this. I was told that my North American confrontational ways are not effective in Asia. For sure, for sure. <laughs> quiet down, quiet down over there. <laughs> But yeah. my thought is like, that is hip hop though, but that is yeah. hip hop. And I've seen Maja, you know, I sent you audio of her performing in the Gare, and she was teaching kids how to do dance hall dance moves. Like <laughs> I've, I've seen Maja in all sorts of different environments and clubs, and I know she played like in a big theater with Lauren Hill, right? And like so, every sort of environment you've done your thing in. Amazing. What do you? Uh, you're now because you're based in Asia, right? Like, do you record anything in? Do you speak Chinese? You speak Chinese, Cantonese, Mandarin. Hi how. Not I, I functional eight year old Maja Mandarin. <laughs> so have you functional. ever have you considered making music in more of like a local language? Because I know I rap in English too, but I have that problem being in Hong Kong or China to be like a lot of people are like, Oh, we don't understand you. I'm like, Well, you know, like this is how I yeah. came up. This is like the forte. I'm not gonna play to the like lower card, you know, like no not just because I just don't know it, right? I don't know the slang. Yeah. I wouldn't be, you know, like, but have you considered I mean, doing projects? 
yeah, being back here in Asia, like, was the first time I started releasing some uh, Chinese man Mandarin songs. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, I definitely got a lot of help <laughs> in writing them. Right, right, I'll right. just kind of be like, this is the flow I want. Da, 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 da. And then I will, it's pretty hilarious. I'm like, I'm going to make my very Chinese, as best as I can, Chinese noises for words that I wouldn't know. All right. And so yeah. that <laughs> That's what I tell people, I, too. I, I tell people. My Cantonese is terrible, right? So when I went to, I only know how to cuss because my, my mom speaks Cantonese, but I only get like, mo yong, san hai mo yong, da, 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 da. like, you know, really like cussy kind mm -hmm. of Cantonese. So That's such nice Hong cussing, Kong. man. That's not even cussing. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn how to make Chinese noises like, mm, ah, ha, <laughs> to, to like write it out a little bit. <laughs> right, right. No doubt, no, no, no doubt. But yeah, I, I, I released, I released uh, some Chinese music recently in the last uh, year or so. And yeah. um, I found that in the sync and licensing business, Chinese hip hop, Chinese trap, specifically Chinese trap, is really popular for American Netflix shows right now. Oh, so, right, right. Yeah. So I was able to get a couple placements with some Chinese songs. Oh, wow. Crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. What but, do you think I mean, about that? My Jamaican is better than my Chinese, which is terrible, but I'm working on it. Your Jamaican? My Jamaican slang is better than my Mandarin. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> yeah. Yourselves, what do you guys that, think about that, Brian? Like, you're also, you know, like you're in China. You know, is it important yeah. to at least have something towards the local audience? Or is it tough for you to, like, are you getting play, Mesia, in like local radio stations in Kuala Lumpur, anything in Singapore, is that happening? It is, I mean, Singapore is a little tougher because Singapore just killed their only independent radios or their only radio station that plays Singaporean artists. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, see, that's like <laughs> so, Hong Kong. It's like, yeah. no, we want but the commercial. But Singapore still has its like little college and underground stations and stuff. Oh, really, Singapore, man. It's like straight clear channel now. Wow. Um, I, so, yeah, like, you, I mean, that, 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 well, like, I mean, what I would say is like, I mean, it's such a, you know, I just did, um, I was just in Ningbo, Nanjing, Danyang, and Harbin, and it is such a difference now from, I'll just even say five years ago, where you would not hear, I would be the only one spinning Chinese hip hop music, yeah. and now Chinese DJs play Chinese hip hop, it's yeah. real, it's, it, it's, it's all coming from the TV stuff, and, uh, it's it's really that you know like they'll play some some other you know real big trap songs and real big like uh, major hip hop hits but a lot of it comes from Chinese stuff. So I go and pick Chinese up the local stuff. stuff. Has gone levels now too though, man. Like yeah, seriously. yeah. Is I it? Uh, I, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Lindsay. Yeah. I first started visiting Southeast Asia, coming back to Singapore and Malaysia. I found that a lot of the artists here were trying to emulate an American accent. Like, it sounded very strange because you speak another language, but you emulate that American, yeah, yeah, man. And I was yeah, like, oh, exactly oh. that accent. <laughs> it's just that one. <laughs> <laughs> but now when we get back to the, uh, like today's artists, I think it's totally different. Southeast Asia is getting proud of their yeah. own languages, their yeah. own culture, their own fashion, their own like, you know, inspirations. So I think it's, it's cool. It's, it's, it's on the come up. Yeah, I think that's the next level where it starts bleeding back. And it's like, look, we're really proud of what we're doing. You can tell I'm from Kuala Lumpur, yeah. Singapore, by the way that I dress, the way that I speak, and let that bleed back into the culture. I'm really excited to sort of see that yeah. start yeah, happening. Me too. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, record, the record label that I run is called New Santara Records. And New Santara used to be the old historical name for like Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, before it was split up into different countries. Oh, All okay. those islands were under the same sultan. So it's oh, called perfect. Nusantara Records because we're like, we're proud of this region and, and its culture. Oh, dope. Tell us uh, who's on your label. Who, who, who are you <laughs> signing? Who's, who's coming up? Well, right. Well, I can, tr let's, let's transition into Suka Suka Sauce. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, for, for now, it's only been a limited amount of signings. I have a producer. I have mostly producers on the label um, because I want to help facilitate more artists here to get yeah. international. So we have uh, DJ Alex. We have Jaw Wise Productions. I'm a guy named Miserable Man. We're hoping to sign by the end of this year. Um, but mostly producers thus far. 
but okay. a lot of the work we've been doing is taking local artists and local music and finding opportunities for it in like American Netflix in movies like syncing licensing deals so oh, that's pretty good. Uh, okay. yeah that more I don't know I I've been trying to figure it out because I know gone are the days of record labels signing you and tying you down to like you know a t 10 year contract of something and Mm -hmm. We're looking at how mm -hmm. to help the community without necessarily saying like, hey, you should still as an artist be able to choose what's best for your career. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's dope. You're kind of putting food on the plate for them, like not really locking them into these like the, the horror nightmare situations that you hear about with some of these kids. Like, well, I signed everything LA, away. I, coming out of L.A., I was offered a real, uh, a, well, it was a beautiful situation because I was working with like my, my idols and my hip hop heroes. But the deal that was presented was pretty bad and signed me for like, I think eight years. And it, it, now the, the majors were signing a lot of 360s at a time. So mm, how I love yes. drawing, how I have like hip hustle ideas, they would get a piece of like the whole kind of pie. Yeah, but what yeah. I never understood is like if the talent or the artist or the person creating is very unhappy with their situation, then you're not going to want what they make anymore, really. Yeah, you know, right. it's just like right. an ugly situation. So we're, we're trying to um, cool. move forward to the future of what record labels will look like. And one well, of you, things... you mentioned Suka Suka sauce, and you said, yeah. is it the thing like that you get the sauce and then you scan a QR code or something on it, right? And then you get like a playlist. Isn't that the oh. idea? Yeah, so to, a little background is that when I moved from Jamaica directly back to Singapore, I had a culture shock because I look Singaporean, but I didn't think very Singaporean. And one of the things that I really missed, strangely enough, was jerk chicken. I yeah, you don't get that anywhere in Asia. You don't man. get that in Asia. Fuck like, that, that dude. Yeah. There are a couple of restaurants that say they serve jerk, and when it shows up, I'm like, yo, Mayu, what is this? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> and they're looking at me like, why is this girl so passionate about the jerk chicken? But I'm, like, I'm actually getting angry that they're calling this jerk chicken. Yes. So I took it upon myself to create my own jerk sauce. Uh, we, I, I flew to Jamaica. I brought back some seeds. We leased a small farm plot in, uh, in Malaysia. Malaysia's weather is a lot like Jamaica. Uh -huh. And we grew a lot of the herbs and spices that would be used yeah. uh, for yeah. jerk marinade out here. And now we produce suka suka sauce. Wow. And the one thing yeah. I noticed in Asia is that I feel, especially Singaporeans, I, should, I shouldn't speak about Asia, I should speak on Singaporeans. Mm. In Singapore, it's really hard to introduce Singaporeans to a new culture of music, let's say. You know, if they're playing reggae, they're like, uh, Misha, I don't know this reggae, reggae thing. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Mm. And it's almost like you're scared, you know. Like, <laughs> but if you told like you know a, a Chinese auntie or uncle like, uh, you want to try the food that they make in Jamaica? It's spicy. Mm. It's nice, you know, mm. nice or not. So they're more likely to try the food that they don't know than the culture and the music that they don't know. Ah, you know? yeah, true, true, true. I and agree. when I thought about that, I'm like, well, let's trick them into falling in love with the culture. <laughs> <laughs> Tip yourself, buy my book. <laughs> what chapter is that? Chapter eight. You know, chapter eight. <laughs> trick them by feeding their stomachs. <laughs> I think that's like a in the woman's book of game too. You know, like go to the stomach, get that guy by the stomach, man. <laughs> Throw down that lasagna, girl. You got it for life. <laughs> but you know what? For any cuisine, I could see like jerk. And Singapore working because you guys do like the spicy, you know, like you kind of like that good kick in it. So I could see like, mm -hmm. if I had to guess, I could kind of go, yeah, Singapore would be all right for jerk. Yeah, that would kind of work. Because yeah, that Indo yeah. type thing going on and stuff. So, hundred yeah. percent. And I, and I would taste, I would taste test it, right? So we ran these parties. Singapore Dub Club would run these parties where we called it the Great Singapore Jerk Off. <laughs> yeah, dirty, dirty. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they, they got really big because the name was kind of cheeky and and we would battle jerk recipes but they wouldn't realize it's just me battling my own recipes against <laughs> <laughs> i pretend to be like different jerk recipes that's so the proper pimp shit though <laughs> like, i'm just running the whole yeah. thing like, like... <laughs> so one would be saltier one would be sweeter one would be more spicy and we did this for three, three, four years until we got the formula that 
the Southeast Asian palate can understand while staying authentic to the Caribbean cooking. Right. And so we created Suka Suka sauce. So my, right. the first launch of the sauce, it's out there, it's working, people love it. Um, and now the next phase, which is starting this year, is we're going to incorporate a lot of independent artists, a lot of subculture music in the sauce so that when you open the sauce, you have to listen to this, like you scan the code, you have to listen to the soundtrack while you're cooking or the food won't taste good. And then like help people discover new artists in this region. Oh wow, that's dope. It works really well. It rolls off the tongue really well too to say like we incorporate <laughs> artists into the sauce. <laughs> like, <it's laughs> like, yeah. House, house. <laughs> Can you talk about, um, you know, like coming from Toronto and like that kind of hip hop, like straightforward, let's just say classic hip hop sound. Like it sounds where we all kind of come from. Like, you know, you seem to kind of have gone into like incorporating a world sound into your music. Do you think that was like through traveling or like what exposed you to be, cause that's quite a brave step as a hip hop artist, you know? Cause I feel like my come up with hip hop was like, yo, it's got to sound like this. And you got to be like hard as a motherfucker. And you're know, like, yeah, yeah. you ain't gonna rap about feelings or nothing. You know, like you don't have none of those, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like you got a song about feelings. Tell me you got one song about feelings. Yeah, yeah. You know, like when Andre 3000 was getting popular, people were like, oh, what was that? Like, mm -hmm. they're straight yeah, aliens. Yeah. Dude, like, go crazy. yeah, so like, how did you, find your own voice and confidence to kind of go for that because that's quite early on like when you're putting out music you know like that's a, that's you know, that's that's a good question actually uh, i think that when i first came out they're like oh you know you're you're just a chick that's chinese and you rap so like that's your shtick you know yeah, but those are, i was yeah. i felt so much to prove that like no i'm not a dope female mc i'm a dope mc like i didn't want mm -hmm. that female mc category or tag on me exclusively right mm -hmm. but then after that i just started touring i started touring some like outback you know small towns in canada what? and there'd be like one vietnamese girl that lives in that town and she'd come running up to me and she's like i get beat up every day for being vietnamese and when you were on tv you made it cool to be asian and now i don't get beat up and i'm like are you serious this is crazy right now and maybe i do have a role to play as a female MC and as an Asian MC and I shouldn't reject reject that so much you know mm -hmm, yeah. and so as I kind of like went through the my career I realized that at at all points everyone's gonna try to pigeonhole you or say like yeah you sound like Missy Elliott or you look like this or you must be this and everyone's always gonna try to do that um, but I don't know if your career lasts long enough then you could be all those things to many different people <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, like, like, uh, like on Far East Empress, there's some really raw, emotional, like, uh, relationship songs where there's some anger there, you know. Really? And Far then, East like, on she forgot about those dudes already. <laughs> she like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> like whatever with those cats. I got this sauce. <laughs> there's, there's, some, there's some anger in there. <laughs> Oh, oh flowers. 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 go on it go go on go on ask her ask her it's not, lover, it's not anger at lovers it's anger at like haterisms uh, <laughs> and like mm, i think every mc and an artist experiences because the, the song starts with the line been a lot of talking man and that's what a lot happens right there's been a lot of talking and but how many of us have the bravery to actually go forward and make that tangible and real and make it a part of your life and these kind of things. So yeah, yeah, it was it was less lovers and more like haterisms. Uh, All right, yeah. <laughs> Does that happen? Do you think that happens in a lot of other genres, Brian? Because you play a lot of, you you know, a whole variety of music. Are like country guys going, "Yo, your shit is whack, dude. Like, don't be coming out with that. Like, fucking." <laughs> well, <laughs> well. I mean, sure. I mean, there's the the whole idea of you know cutting in jazz, you know, of of horn guys going at each other. But especially like in blues, you've got like Big Mama Thorne records um, Hound Dog, and then Rufus Thomas says, "Well, you ain't nothing but a bear cat," you know. Like the blues guys would go at each other really hard. So there were the ideas of answer songs, you know, right. Muddy Waters, and Bo Diddley went back and forth at each other. So like, there's that sort of that, that, that sort of um, dozens tradition right, right. from African-American culture, the idea of just, you know, just saying ridiculous things, you know, the, the roots of your mama jokes right. is, can be found in the blues, you know.
But do you think fans, you can't think fans are like that? Because hip hop is like, we'll rap about fans, like you fucking haters. <laughs> like, yeah. like, That's true. Know, it's just like Ruth, or, or maybe it's like the age of social media where you can attack anybody, you know, like. <laughs> I think I commented on like Justin Bieber taking a picture with uh, Roger Federer one time and I was like yo the same look all the time like some cocked up eyebrow thing from Bieber and like five people came at me out of the blue like my Instagram was never so hot you know it was like with all these comments of like you don't mess with the Biebs man and I was like who the fuck <laughs> well I, I think for me I've always been willing to be very straightforward and raw and I would want to tell someone to fuck off I will kind of thing because I think it's from the early thing where I didn't want to it was expected that an Asian female in hip-hop would be doing spoken word poetry Bong. Raga Waka Sun Ho Hey, hey. You better work it. Excess. Sleep. DJ Sarasa. Chicka, 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 chicka. Boom, boom. I can't help it. Life a heavy deck of cards, so I dealt it. I'm the fire from the spark, and you felt it. Pull a light up from the dark, then you melt it. I was building up an arc when it's raining. Well, no better time to stop when we're painting. Why you wanna make a mark? What you saying? What you playing? What you saying, baby? What you saying? Make a statement now, no delay. Fashion in the breeze, we don't sway. Why they hating? Escapating. Bad mind, watch your face when I read them. Heard them talking dreams they were chasing. Now they snorting keys off a of basin. Now they down on knees when they praying. Why you faking? G's time wait. Yeah. 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 So they're like, so what do you do? Like some conscious jazzy <laughs> stuff. And they're like, nah, I got a song called Disneyland. It goes, y'all motherfuckers are Disneyland. So I, I, <laughs> I wanted that, that to. That early stuff is raw. It's, it's early, you know, it's backpack, hard, you know, grimy beats. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to purposefully say like, yo, I'm not doing jazzy spoken word, you know, like there's a lot, you're allowed to. And, and as a, as an Asian person, as a female, you're allowed to enter the arenas that you you want to. No one can tell you you're not allowed to. So right. Right. So, so. that's how I saw it. Same, same the, thing happened is... with Chinese Virus, though, where I just released the song called Chinese Virus addressing the backlash of racism against Asian people around the world. Uh, but it's a bit tongue in cheek, right? Because we heard Trump say, what was it? Chi China virus? China, but uh, China, mm -hmm. China is more like a slang yeah. for Asian people. And uh, I, th I think it offended some people, but what offended them was nothing other than the title of the song. Yeah. So they would, the song wasn't listened to; it was just the title that offended. I thought yeah. I thought I played that song last month. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to say that I, I wrote that song because I feel like an Asian, an expected Asian response to racism. I feel kind of, I've, I've experienced this kind of like model minority kind of, they think that Asians are nice, demure people, that the model minority that will be obedient, that will not dissent too hard. So I just wanted to just be as rude <laughs> as possible. Yeah, be like, sure. yo, ching ching chong of the Chinese virus. Ching ching chong. Because I, I want to throw that racism back at them to say like, yo, this is what it looks like to me and this is how little it, it means to me. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And you got the uh, Bruce Lee and the Hong Kong sound effects on that too. So. <laughs> so some Hong Kong reference for you, Nick. That's what people. That's what people reference then. Like, uh, yeah, they'd be like, "Oh, kung fu! Damn, <laughs> check that out!" Man. Yeah, yeah. Yo, what is the environment? Why, why from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur? And is there an environment that's quite sensitive about content there? You know, like. Is it quite Muslim? Is it is there these kind of things that might make you? Does it affect your writing? Does it affect the music you put out? Like, is there censorship going on over there? Well, I think that when the pandemic came, I was staying in Johor Bahru, which is the border town between Malaysia and Singapore, hmm. and so I asked myself, like, okay, if we're gonna lock lock it down, where do I be locked down in? And there are beautiful islands and crazy places to explore on this end. And Kuala Lumpur's musical community right now reminds me of early 2000s Toronto. A wow. lot, a lot. Whereas, yeah. you know, like, 
you know, girl in hijab that looks very demure, and all of a sudden opens her mouth and she sings like Shaka Khan, you know, like uh, MCs are killing it out here. Kids are so, videographers are so um, creative in how they express themselves. And this, this does remind me a lot of my early days in Toronto because like, even when you don't have much, you create something from nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's just, to me, part of the beauty of creation. So I love the environment here. I've been sticking around it. Um, I think censorship in Singapore and Malaysia is high and not one not being more than the other, but just realizing that different words have different sensitivities in both mm -hmm. countries. Um, the word church in freedom, my song Freedom Fades was censored off the radio here in KL. Well, like church is a swear word but anyways yeah. but in singapore for example i called someone like it's like sucker mc like sucker the word sucker was was censored and i was like why why is the word sucker is <laughs> censored and uh the i ever had to rotating actually... censorship like you know like oh whatever comes out of her mouth we should censor <laughs> yeah, yeah. that why one she says it's censored it's censored <laughs> but uh, what's that movie called? Sucker Punch. So they, they approved a movie called Sucker Punch in Singapore, but they they censored the word sucker. So I had to make this whole case where like, look, this movie is playing in your theaters and it's called Sucker Punch. So it, it's a work in progress for sure. Um, I think beyond censorship, it's also a matter of, how do you say this? Um, I, I think deeper than censorship is really... Where, when do we begin to introduce this idea of like social impact, social change, or actually act, saying something, right, mm. um, that, that helps people in the music? Because there's a lot of social issues that are very taboo in this part of the world. Um, you know, not being able exactly. to mention anything about anything, anything about sexual abuse for sure. No, uh, racism is sensitive because we're a multicultural country. Don't say anything about us being racist. Uh, so a lot of these issues that are real and tangible and even mental health. What do you mean? We have a happy society. Let's not talk about mental health. Mm. So I think all of these issues are so taboo that a lot of the artists really have ended up being entertainers, entertainers in the truest form which has its place, I'm not knocking it, but I would love to see a growth in like the bravery, not just to challenge censorship and, you know, just say motherfucker, don't censor me, but go a step deeper and, and start touching on topics that actually mean something, even if it's taboo in your society. Like, yeah, like, I, like I'm doing this project on Sunday where we're doing uh, a live soundtrack for a silent movie and I'm working with uh, the, the head of the, the big jazz group here and I'm, I'm doing some scratching and some sound effects for it and stuff and like what's what's frustrating is not even necessarily like the outside censorship because I really wanted to touch on some themes with you know in terms of pandemic and mental health things with what we're doing on Sunday but it it doesn't become the outside it's becomes from people just worried about the censorship and the self-censorship I think it almost be worse than the external one because it's not like things are getting bleeped out it's people don't want to even be put in a situation where things could be bleeped out yeah absolutely like like don't don't make it don't make it yeah. you know, erase yeah. at all i think the the ep i just put out was called freedom fades it wasn't well received by singapore media because they felt that the title was too depressing right Ugh. so this idea of freedom fading is like, ah, oh, that's not what we should be telling people right now. We should be telling people to exercise at home and have a great time, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but it did amazingly well in European markets and it was played crazy amounts on like national radio in Portugal and, and, and in Italy and in places that Corona was really actually affecting. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I, I guess what we could say about censorship is like, you know, you have to be true to your, your message and your heart. And if yeah. you don't find an audience, even in my own hometown, then let's find someone understands what you're saying and, and it's okay. We live yeah. in an international community. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to reach people. You don't want to be performing a song that you don't really like, you didn't really write about <laughs> yourself, and this is the one that popped off. <laughs> like, God damn. Well, I mean, even speaking about social media, it was a realization that often in a lot of, I think, Asian music business circles, 
that an artist is paid by becoming an influencer, right? Like we, we can sell product in Asia, write a rap about the shampoo. I'm like, okay, how good's the shampoo? Um, but, and then you start doing that because that becomes your main source of income for a lot of the artists and creatives. Mm. And then you start learning how to write to, to sell something. You don't ever, you, the process of writing because you just have to and it's spewing out of your heart and you can't help it. Uh, that starts getting dulled down, you know? Yeah. Uh, we go to a rehearsal studio and when we came in, the cover band would be rehearsing after us. And the cover band in Singapore is just like, oh, you play originals, we feel sorry for you guys. Because they know that cover bands get paid in Singapore and you're playing originals, good luck to your life. Wow, 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 interesting. Mm -hmm. I would almost think it's the other way around. Can you speak a bit on, because like you're, you're like, I would consider you an indie artist, but you had so much experience in the commercial form of like, you, you did with some huge names. Like, you know, like, yeah, yeah. How, how was the benefit of that process? Did they come in and go help you refine sort of writing skills? Like, you know, like, offer you insights that were quite different? Like, oh, I'm an independent artist. I'm going to go for 95 bars on this and do an eight minute song. Did they come in with <laughs> some like, album yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, was there, was, was, how, can you just talk about that process a little bit? Because we talked to a lot of indie artists. We don't talk to a lot of, uh, you know, that's quite an insight. I spent a lot of time um, writing hooks, learning the art of writing hooks, right? And there's there's writing sessions. Um, well, I started experiencing serious, like, major label writing sessions for the first time, where it could be you in a room full of, like, you know, other writers, and they put on a beat, and you write the best hook you possibly can, and you think that your, your shit is amazing, like, you are a genius. And then you realize that like the three other Swedish ladies in the room have been like killing it on the pop scene since ABBA existed and they're killing it too. And their, their clothes are amazing. And so you really start training, you know, like it's like playing, playing ball with people that are not as good as you or playing ball with people that are better than you. you. You start elevating your level because you're so inspired by how damn good these people are. And I think the thing that stuck with me most was uh, this lady, Marsha Ambrosia, she was part of Flo she's part of Floetry, yeah. you know, the group Floetry, know her. the singer yeah. in Floetry. Um, if you guys don't know, say yes. Oh, what a song. Anyways, uh, I met her and she said that she wrote and recorded one song every day, every single day of her life. She finishes from start to end one song. And I thought that was so incredible. I'm like, how do you do that? And she's like, well, not every day you're going to be inspired from Ja above and have brilliant ideas, but the, the process of actually getting it done and doing it mm -hmm. and the muscle memory, like if you're an athlete, you run every day to get Yeah, done. yeah, well, for sure. If you're a songwriter, then, you know, you might be thrown into any studio and be like, hey, write a song for this person. But because she writes a song every day, she's damn good and she's very Do committed. It. So well, well. I learned... I learned a lot about the industry and some like not so good sides of all the cliches of, of this of the industry, that kind of thing, casting couches and young hopefuls like losing it in Hollywood and all that stuff. But what right. actually stuck with me were like the gems that of phenomenal people I met and they were famous or they were in these positions because they had worked for it, they were incredibly talented and they had longevity. And from those people, I learned a lot. Crazy, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of unsung talent, even in the music industry there, like, you know, studio recordings, musicians. I'll be honest with you, man. Like when, when I sat with a lot of the ghostwriters that I was, you know, writing with, these people are like way more talented than half the shit you see out there. Like, and they're beautiful too. And, and one time I was just like sat in this room of like beautiful women that were just like, they're edgy, but they were just all writing for a star. And then I went to the producer. I'm like, how come these girls aren't artists? Like, why are these girls not killing it? And they're like, well, you don't look like the 15 year old girl that's going to buy this record from Walmart. So we mm -hmm. have to kind of like send these songs to the person that fits that package. And things like that never occurred to me in a million years before I worked in L.A. Yeah, I've only heard about, like, I, I know a friend that kind of got signed to a girl band and they wanted to do her like the Spice Girls. They were like, yo, you're going to be this kind of girl and dye your hair and wear this kind of clothes. And that was in the contract. And then yeah, everything yeah, would yeah, be written. In, in my contract that I was given, if I didn't, I had to contractually do what they had asked in a video. 
And if I don't, then I'd be breaking my contract. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just crazy. It's been a lot of crazy things. Yo, Brian, sign some talent in your live shows and let's just like uh, write them up and uh, <laughs> make them sign 360 yeah. deals for us. Too. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. <laughs> put them in the sauce. Yeah. yeah, put them in the sauce. Holler, holler in the sauce. I mean, I, I've, I've seen a lot of craziness. My first early like signing offers were like gangsters in Detroit that like pushed cash across the table to me and say like, there's more where that's coming from. So how do you feel about your sexuality? And I was like, what? What's that have to do with my music? So I've, mm. I've seen it all, dude. I've seen so much crazy things go down. Um, so, and, I, and I'm not one to uh, speak down to the major labels. Like, I mean, I think there are artists that want to be discovered and want to have a home like a major label and just be famous. And if that's your goal to be famous, then go ahead. But something that really stuck with me that Che, the producer I worked with, said to me was like, well, what is it that you want? In like one sentence, what is it that you want? Because if you're there to get famous and that's your purpose, then by all means, like go with what it is you want. But you got to figure out what you want. Right, right, yeah. They, they actually, I encounter that a lot in the arts too. They're like, you know, like be, be very refined about if it's photography, if you're doing fashion, like just really get it to that one sentence, be able to speak it or else yeah. you're kind of middling between a bunch of things and stuff. Interesting. Right. Yeah. right. Can you uh, tell, tell us about uh, like uh, Asian people all over the world? Because there's a lot of Asian people in Jamaica, aren't there? Oh, yeah, man. The, the Jamaica has a huge Chinese Jamaican population. Um, some of their most famous stars, Tessa, Tessa and Chin, is a Chinese Jamaican. Oh, wow. And, um, okay. In my time there, a lot of people thought that I was Chinese Jamaican. I earned the nickname Chinese Money when I was there. Chinese Money, um, okay. No. <laughs> it, it's a song on uh, on, on one of her uh, early albums too. Okay, yeah. We'll check that. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, it's interesting that to take that and come back to Asia and experience like people aren't in Asia were like, is this Chinese Money thing racist? Um, and I've also like. It's, it's perception, right? Like when you've been able to travel all around the world, you get to see like all kinds of people sounding all kinds of ways. And I, when I came back to Singapore, they're like, who's ever heard of a Chinese person with a Jamaican accent? I'm like, uh, tons of people in, in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And people yeah. think that there was a Chinese population in Jamaica. I think most recently, like um, Hong Kong reggae artist, Mouse, Mouse Effects, Mouse just effects. went to Jamaica. Yeah, to, to, yeah. yeah. To, experience and, and really like yeah, put out his course, yeah. do you know him there. you know him yes i know mouse he's actually yeah. jumping on the remix of one of my new releases so oh don't 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 yeah. we were yeah. thinking about uh trying to get yeah speak to him and uh get him to perform some stuff that was a pretty impressive uh thing that he went over to do and uh he's actually down yeah. with the crew with an even like icon or something this like really old cat yeah, that yeah. i think is yeah, yeah, yeah. If, here's an interesting uh, connection. So the latest uh, reggae music video um, out of Mongolia is by my man Macho. And I got a cameo in the music video. I'm holding my signed Mouse FX record from his latest LP <laughs> no. he just put out. The one live in Jamaica, yeah. You're spreading the pollen, man, mixing everybody together. That's dope, man. I think it's, it's yeah, really yeah. great. Even during the pandemic, when we were started talking about doing this remix, I got Mouse on my Freedom Fades mixtape because I just got like fans and friends from around the world to just send me a voice message to express how the situation is wherever they are in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So that we could hear it in one kind of linear form if there are similarities or if there are cultural differences. And then um, Mouse, Mouse dropped some like science, some Cantonese science for the mixtape. Oh, and, dope. Uh, yeah. So there's and something else. Make, there's the main EP, and then there's a mixtape that, like, what just went around the streets of Singapore, and we didn't get a piece of that. Like, <laughs> it's online. No, um, oh, with, it's online. Okay. I feel I'm all over the place with this discussion. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. With the release of Freedom Fades, which is the last EP I released, um, we entered the kind of cryptocurrency space. So we entered the cryptocurrency space, selling an NFT of Freedom Fades. So what that means is we actually minted the EP, or we minted the, the mixtape, we made this mixtape of Freedom Phase. We minted it so it's a piece of currency, and we released it uh, into the crypto art world. 
So I'm starting to learn a lot more about the cryptocurrency world. I don't know a lot. I can't claim like I know a lot. But what I do understand is this like decentralized money system is a way for us to begin to um, take control of our communities, lead our communities better, like create change and positive change in our communities because we control the flow of the currency. Or, um, for example, I found that the audience that comments on music in the cryptocurrency space is a lot more woke than the regular comments that I get. So in a regular comment, I'd be like, Maisha, that's hot, or like, that sucks, you know, and like, that's your comment. But in the crypto space, it really dug into like, hey, we found out about you. It's, they, they're like, B.O., like, you know, like they're, they're digging into like who you are. Did you create it because of this? And the constructive criticism that comes from that world amazed me. It's not internet trolls. It's actually people that are trying to help and see you succeed. And wow. the value of the thing that they're buying is based on your backstory, the meaning behind the music, the, the person behind the music. Like that's where the value of the currency lies. So it's just a very different way of consuming music, I think. Oh, can you translate that? What did that mean? <laughs> what did that, we're not like crypto. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm playing, I'm playing, but like yeah. I, I was lost a bit at the cryptocurrency. <laughs> Sorry, I understand Matt. all the fans and things, but <laughs> you just opened a whole different door, like the uh, Alice in Wonderland yellow brick road door. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, I'll put it this way. Basically, um, for all the artists out there that feel a bit disheartened that, you know, you could take a year, spend all your money on creating this musical project, and now you just got to throw it up on some platform and hope that in like 10 years Spotify might make you $200 you know like you, it, it's it's that world where you're just like well I put I poured my heart and soul into this song and now I gotta just the way the world goes is I throw it online it's free it's streamed it's consumed and that's that hmm. well I felt that the crypto world allowed you to then turn your song into a piece of currency only release five of them like you can decide how many that you want to release and bring value again to what it is that you're making like your song now becomes a valuable piece of art so that's the best i can break it down okay yeah sim it. keep it simple yeah because i've read some the is, yeah. articles and the, and the audience is, is very it's a very tight-knit community and they're yeah. about building a better world where it's not run by how much shit we can sell you through ad space. It's more built on this world that wants to see uh, leaders and people controlling their communities, you know, like being able yeah. to, ah, yeah, Bio, help me out here. That's interesting. <laughs> that, no, that's really interesting. Have you explored this world, Bo? Like, I have not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I have no idea in terms of cryptocurrency stuff. Misha, Misha's got to be the teacher for that one. Okay, well, look, okay. I'm dropping another crypto art uh, for social distancing, a single called Social Distancing, on January 29th. And there is a launch party. I'll send you guys the links. You enter the space as an avatar and you actually like dance and party at the launch and you get to see live performances and stuff. And that's the crypto world. So January 29th, I'll send you a link and experience it so you start understanding. So can you also, because you're going to give us a little preview of this record, tell us about the people involved. There's a, uh, what, General Ting? Can you tell us how this track came about? And uh, General Ting, yeah. Oh, okay. So are we talking about social distancing? Are we talking about uh, Not All That Glitters, the upcoming? Oh, I'm sorry. Then I mix it up. Those are okay. two different songs. The, uh, the cryptocurrency launch that we're going to be doing is for a song called Social Distancing. It features a West Coast artist named Sabotage. Um, I like that name. I like the way he spells it. That's pretty fresh. <laughs> that we worked with. I worked with him for years. Um, when yeah, I was living in LA, on the... I couldn't take LA anymore. I would drive down to San Diego and just holler at him, and we'd record. We even made like a super underground uh, release called High Place Drive. But I digress. Um, and also a, a DJ from Brazil that I started talking to during the pandemic, and I loved his scratches, and we just start connecting. I'm like, you know what? How ironic would it be that a song called Social Distancing has an artist from Singapore, Malaysia, Brazil, and California trying to work together remotely? Ah, dope. Do the knowledge, man. Yeah, that is crazy. And that's a very, maybe an ode to a bit of your roots. It's, it's quite a classic kind of hip-hop, East Coast yeah, beat, I would say. Fat. 
Yeah, you do that diggity that's diggity that's thing too. You do the diggity yeah, diggity. Yeah, 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 like the old Das Effects thing. Das Effects, yeah. You know, I love Das Effects. Uh, I thought to myself when we were writing this song, like, well, now we're kind of all down about this, like social distancing, stay five feet apart, you know, wear a mask. Da, da. What wouldn't it be a lot better if governments and S and politicians wrapped? your SOPs and the, the, the safety measures, at least there'd be like some fun in our lives. So I just attempted to rap about social distancing. Oh, nice. nice. <laughs> so not everything would be too depressing. We may be listening to our public health authorities. They may, may be recommending what they call social distancing. Well, what does that mean? I'm about to break it, break it down to you three times to charm a hat trick. I pick it, bounce around the viral town, she's wild, dramatic. No diggity, no one doubt, I'm loud like when no Harajuku. Biggity, make my way back home, you want some, I want buku. Salute you, namaste, no more handshake like you used to. People isolate, stay home alone and play Sudoku. Told you before, and I say it again. No more gathering, more than ten, learn the hand and text a friend. The situation changing many times, and I'm still counting. Illuminati books are balanced, and we ain't accountants. Conspiracy type theories floating around, and we allow it, cause it's all about the Benjamins dancing for the hour. Come on. If you can move it, then I move it. Keep it moving. Come on. If you move it, then we moving by the hour. Come on. If you move it, then I'm moving. Then we moving some more. Watch you moving. All this moving might be breaking the law. You got a you got a new single coming out. You've been busy. Tell yeah, us about the new new song that you kind of. Well, basically, in the last little while of the pandemic, um, I've been really back on that boom bap stuff. And there's something about being isolated. There's something about like uh, the world seemingly going into uh, an apocalypse that gets you back to your roots. So I think that where I started, <laughs> where I started all of this was from boom bap hip hop, was Mississauga, was like hip hop is the love of my life. It's like the first thing that kind of sparked you to be like, yo, I want to do this. I want to like, and you like go in front of the mirror and like rap or like write little raps and hide it under your bed. Like it brought me back to that place. And that's why Freedom Phase was very much like that 90s, 90 BPM kind of hip hop thing. Um, but of course, I, I love I love uh, reggae music. I love Afro beats. I love music from all around the world. So it's a three part EP series. The next EP will go more into my LA life. So I'll be writing more catchy hooks, more mainstream sounding things, some uh, stuff that goes there. And I imagine the third one will be reggae because that's like the third kind of transition for me. Um, but this record that's coming out February 4th, it is a reggae record. Um, it gets pretty serious because the song's called Not All That Glitters Is Gold. And in 2019, I was in tour in Melbourne, Australia and a sexual assault was charged by my assistant on another artist on the tour. And as you can imagine, it's, it's a pretty crazy situation to be on tour and realize that you're not safe and even with the people that are involved. Um, and it's not, it's not that I haven't spoken or thought about uh, things like sexual harassment, sexual assault before, because as a female artist that's been in the industry for over 15 years now, uh, I've definitely gone to a produ producer's house and all of a sudden like the lights are off and there's candles and you're like, wait a minute, I'm not recording, am I? You know, like there's there's lots of instances that are like this, right? Or, you like, spoken word poem. <laughs> you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> it's mood lighting. Or, you know, one of the first people that were trying to sign me out of college would kind of like show up at all my shows in this yellow Lamborghini and be like, come in, Major, and I'm like, there's no seats, it's a two-seater, and they're like, right on my lap, sit right here, you know, like, so there's, I've experienced all of that stuff, and of course, I've gone through it in my career, but I have never been this close to a situation where an actual violation has happened, um, I don't want to say under my watch, but like, that, that, this, that, that this happened, and I felt that that made me begin to reflect a lot about Yes, I know that I'm in a very male industry. Hip hop has always been a very male stomping ground. It's slowly changing, but you know, uh, reggae is also a very male dominated stomping ground. And I think the greatest lie that was kind of ever put out there is that rape is a women's issue. Well, it's not a woman's issue. It's like a human issue. It's like, it takes two people to be there for this to happen kind of thing, you know? So then I've taken 
I, I feel it's really important, like more than a song this time, I think it's really important to be have the bravery to speak out about it. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that this song and the campaign that follows also empowers my assistant who has decided to come to speak out about it, that empowers her to help other survivors too. Um, the case is still an open case, so um, she's waiting for a charge. But until then, I'm like, well, we shouldn't sit and feel powerless that we can't do anything and it's up to the police to do something and all these things. Mm -hmm. I feel like as artists, we should remember that art is there to like, you know, provoke change, social yeah. change or personal change or whatever it is. Uh, so it's a roots reggae song where I'm going into that space of sound system. Um, but I don't, it's not something that's really spoken about very often in, in reggae music and in Jamaican culture, even though it should be spoken about. Mm. And for me in Asia, it's been definitely a huge challenge to speak out about it because it's a taboo topic. You know, in Asia, we know golden silence, right? And it's definitely a taboo topic. But I know that as an MC, I have an 88% male following on all my socials. <laughs> Well, yeah. Like, come on, ladies. I'm cool. Like, I'm that's cool. surprising. I find that surprising. Yo, your <laughs> testicle festival up in my socials, homie. It's like, all oh, dudes, hot dog party. <laughs> but Where are the ladies at? Where are the ladies at? Hip -hop at? Ladies, at? ladies come out to my live shows, but they are not representing on them socials, man. But I, I don't really post stuff about like makeup tutorials and blah, 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 blah. So I, I don't put up the typical, I guess, female oriented stuff. But because of that, I feel that I have something special here that I can actually start conversations, un uncomfortable conversations about misogyny or like um, sexual assault and have a male audience and be like, yo, I'm not trying to tell you guys like, you know, uh, and I, I remember after Me Too, everyone's like, yo, I can't even go on a date now. We don't know if the girl would be like, you know, okay with it. <laughs> but I think that you can have conversations and, and it not be like, you know, exaggerated or pigeonholed. And I think I'm in a unique position where I can have those conversations. So yeah. go for it. Yeah. See what happens. Well said, well so said. the song's called Not All That Glitters Is Gold. And basically the main message is that just because someone has fame, power or influence, it does not mean that they're not capable of co committing a violation against someone. Mm -hmm. Too true, too true. Even more power I makes think, them, I don't know, some abuses well, of power as well. In, in Singapore, you know, success is seen as, as money and a position of influence. So, you know, if there's a reported case of a, a doctor molesting a patient or something like, no lie, he's such a good doctor and he's got all these qualifications and he's got this degree and he makes so much money, why would he go do that? Mm. So I think that's something that a lot of people, a lot of survivors struggle with because they don't speak out against someone that's hurt them because they just don't have the power to, that that yeah, person has yeah, too yeah. much influence and fame. Helpless, yeah. And so essentially that is the main message of the song, not all that glitters is gold. You mentioned a little bit you're looking to connect with certain people in Hong Kong out of the song. Is that true? Yeah. I want to put a shout out out there that if there are um, organizations that deal with gender based violence, if there are like women support organizations or even men, even on the grassroots level, like anyone that is down to speak out against bullshit and violations, like let's let's work, let's talk like this is this particular single isn't like some mainstream marketing push. This is like really from the heart and I want to see something good come from it. And we're opening up the song for a remix. Um, we have an all-male remix of the song coming together, actually, because when we put it out there as a remix, a male artist told me, like, Major, that's cool, but it's a woman song, right? It's a woman ting. And I was like, how powerful would it be if that this, like, traditionally woman ting was a remix of all-male artists speaking out mm. of it? So, mm. yeah, we got dudes on a remix, and oh, oh. it's... It's gonna go. It's gonna go. <laughs> cool, cool. We'll check it. We'll share out the info. Oh yeah, DJ Bo, what do you gotta say? What do you gotta say? Lining this up, I think maybe we should. You know, hey, you're welcome to come on the show and talk a bunch of stuff. I think like there's so much that we want to get into with you. You've done so much. This kind of went like in a wildly <laughs> back and forth. 
but um you know you're welcome back when you have new music or even things you want to talk about hit us up maybe you can set off the conversation we'd be down and um, thanks i appreciate it and like you know what pass me your addresses i'll make sure you get that suka suka sauce music discovery when the thing launches <laughs> oh no no absolutely and, uh, and i'd love to send you a mask too so yeah. okay yeah thank you thank you what is your what for, for your for the fans for the new fans uh hit them with an ig some, somewhere to find you and stuff sure so my name is Masha one that's asia with an m in front m-a-s-i-a-o-n-e uh, the propaganda is deep, hashtag China money every day, um, or hashtag- China money most days. China money most days. <laughs> every day. Every um, day. Every. <laughs> the Far East Empress, and the newest release that is out right now is called Freedom Fades. I released it as a mask with an, a Spotify embeddable code. So wow. you just like stand for the music, put on the mask, and hit the road for your pandemic soundtrack. So holler, the proceeds go to help mental health and suicide prevention here in Singapore. So yeah, that's where I'm at. Major one all day, just holler. Dope, dope, dope. DJ Bo. What Hit you me up say? on uh, Instagram, DJ Border Breaks, DJ Border Breaks. Uh, Art Gear, we just got some more videos coming up. And I'll be in Ningbo on the 30th and 31st. Otherwise, I got gigs all around Shanghai. Hit me up. And on you can, WeChat under Toe Jam, T O U J A M. What's and up? you can uh, sign up to his pay to play website to see his tattoo where he'll show it to you at oh, a that's price. Right. <laughs> Just pick it. Yeah, that's right. You got to see him show lives. Yo, you got to do a t shirt of that Amazia One uh, banner. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, well, I'll, send, I'll send the link. Yeah. I, I've been saying major league, major league. I want to be a, a member of the fan club. Yeah, that's dope, man. Are you coming with merch? How come you don't got merch? You're such a popular artist. I got, I, well, well she's got merch. She's got yeah, merch. <laughs> no major league merch though. I like this. I like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got <laughs> DJ Bo snap bracelets that I, I hawk around. I'll send you guys bracelet. one. Someone hit me up. Us. Bracelets? Crazy. I want one. I haven't seen a snap bracelet. You're tying people up, dude. Tie them down. 